Hola and welcome. My name is Wilberto Andres Supertonantes, and I'm the team leader of the Discovery and Endeavor Serious Interplanetary Pathway for Human Exploration and Research, Decipher, from the University of Puerto Rico at Maya West. Today, my team and I will be guiding you through a project and how it complies with the requirements of Team 4 of the NASA RASCAL 2021 competition. Decipher presents an end-to-end -end mission concept to the dwarf planet Ceres, which is located at 2.77 astronomical units, thus being one of the farthest destinations humans may venture to in the next decades. With an extremely low gravity of only 0.27 meters per second squared, a complex geologic record, the presence of water ice, and the potential for present-day brines, this is one of the most interesting places to visit in the solar system. To develop this mission, we had to comply with the requirements and constraints of the competition, which were the following. Transport a crew of four to and from Ceres in the 2040s. Land at least two crew members on the surface no later than December 31st, 2049. Utilize the close proximity to Ceres to conduct low latency science and to identify planetary science payloads. A maximum time of flight for the human crew of less than five years, which is influenced by the long-term health effects that arise in a deep space mission such as this one. And a maximum annual budget of $3 billion per year, starting in fiscal year 2035 and extending all the way through the end of the mission. After initial research and trade off, it was apparent that we needed to optimize the science return and minimize the time of flight for the crew. By comparing chemical and nuclear thermal propulsion, it was evident that NTP would be the only feasible option for the mission's propulsion system by reducing the vehicle size and the mission's cost and timeline. This decision is supported by the Mars Reference Design Architecture 5.0. Recent policies such as the Space Policy Directive 6 and NASA's current notional plans of sending a crewed NTP propulsion spacecraft to Mars in 2039. Therefore, it is assumed that NTP will be readily mature by the time of our mission and that our concept will use existing flight hardware and ground infrastructure. However, even when using NTP, the Delta V requirements for the round trip exceeded 10 km per second, yielding an overly large spacecraft. Thus, we researched possible launch windows during the 2040s and studied their impact on the schedule and cost of the mission. We came to the conclusion that the mission will be conducted by two deep space transports, Endeavour 1 and Endeavour 2. E1 will perform the reconnaissance and science mission and the return to the Earth, while E2 will conduct the crewed exploration mission. The prior development life cycle for both spacecraft begins in fiscal year 2035 with pre-phase A, concept studies. However, the duration of each subsequent phase varies due to selected launch windows and the particular considerations of each DSD. E1 launches on December 16, 2045, and will arrive on Ceres on March 1, 2047, when it will start the RSM by deploying the robotic explorers, which will both further the scientific research on Ceres and prepare for the eventual landing of the crew in 2049. Since this vehicle does not initially transport the crew's spacecraft, the PDLC should be more streamlined. In turn, we allocated more time between phases for E2, as this DST will carry the crew, the life app, the Discovery Lander, and all other crew systems upon launch. For us, it was important to provide time for the proper and rigorous testing of the crew system and training for the mission. E2 launches on June 19, 2048 providing an ample margin of roughly 13 years between the start of the mission development and the launch of the crew. A key objective of our project was to minimize the amount of launches needed while demonstrating the feasibility of this mission with current launch capabilities. We achieved this by leveraging the use of Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, and the SLS. The majority of the components were sized for the interior 4.6 meter diameter of the Falcon 9, considering its maximum payload capacity to LEO, low cost, and consistent launch cadence. The life app will launch in a Falcon Heavy due to mass limitations. An SLS Block 1B with an 8.4 meter long payload fairing will be used to launch the larger propulsive stages. Using the SLS implies that the EGS Academy Space Center will see a significant improvement that enables a launch cadence of 6 to 8 months. This may not be possible with only one vehicle assembly building. As initially suggested by the MRDA 5.0, this project also suggests the use of an offline stacking facility for the solid rocket boosters, which will enable the processing and assembly of four additional SRBs at the time, and the use of nuclear and hazardous processing facilities for large propulsion components. It is assumed that the facilities similar to these ones will be used for the Moon to Mars program and will be ready for use in our mission. The in space assembly for both DSTs will happen in LEO at an altitude of 407 kilometers, chosen for the logistical support constant communication with the ground, and its ease of access. One of the disadvantages of this location is the rising risk of MMLD, but this will be mitigated with a 0.5 meter thick MMLD protection on the spacecraft components. 
The in-space assembly for E1 will take approximately 31 months and will require 21 launches. The initial staging and build-up runs for four months, followed by the installation of the large inline tanks and the MTP core stage, which will take around 17 months to complete. Lastly, the drop tanks will be launched and assembled as close as possible to the launch date to prevent the boil-off of the liquid hydrogen propellant. Integrated multilayer insulation and other cryogenic fluid management technologies will be implemented to protect against this boil-off of about 3% per month. Once the assembly is complete, E1 will perform a TCI on December 16, 2045, followed by jettisoning the spent drop tanks and the truss segments, reducing the inner mass of the vehicle. On March 1, 2047, it will arrive at the CSSO at an altitude of 35 kilometers for a total time of flight of 440 days. This is when the RSM will begin with the deployment of the Amigos, Spikes, CubeSats, and other payloads. Two months after the departure of E1, the in-space assembly of E2 starts with the launch of the LM, followed by part of the propulsion stage and the live habitat. During the checkup period, a crew of four will be sent on a crew dragon to assemble the interior of the life fab, set up the lander, and perform system check during four months. The lander will be sent in two separate launches, one for the ascent element and one for the surface habitat and descent element, which will be integrated on the ground. The checkup crew will return to the Earth around 13 months before the departure to Sirius. During this period, additional parts and complete fixes and improvements can be applied. The final assemblies will consist of the NTP core stage and the drop tanks. The Sirius crew will then launch between May and June 2048 for their June 19, 2048 departure to Sirius. Just like in E1, E2 will jettison its drop tanks after TCI to reduce inert mass. The crew will arrive at CSO on August 23, 2049, for a total time of flight of 430 days. Once there, they will wait 14 days before the two surface crew members descend to Ocator Crater for the 60-day expedition beginning on September 7, 2049. On November 6, the ascent element will launch from Sirius and dock to the life app. Shortly after, the render wind docking operations between E1 and E2 will take place. This is where the life app, logistics module, the crew, and three small inland tanks will be transferred to E1, which will depart to Earth on April 24, 2050. E1 will arrive at the Grand Distant Highly Elliptical Orbit on June 28, 2051, for a total time of flight of 430 days. An Orion capsule will splash down with the crew on July 6, 2051, completing the decipher mission with a grand total of 1,112 days in space for the crew. E-1 arrives at a CSSO. This orbit was chosen to relay communications from the other vehicles to the Earth, as well as to deploy scientific payloads and minimize the plane change delta V at Sirius departure. E-2 arrives at a 720-kilometer CSO, which provides direct visibility to a landing site and enables constant communication while the crew is at the surface. After completion of the series mission, E-2 will transfer the crew to E-1 through rendezvous and docking operations. Afterward, E-2 will head towards a helicentric disposal orbit. An assessment was made to determine the feasibility of performing an abort within 30 to 150 days into the mission. The total delta V available to perform all the burns was determined to be 7.5 km per second considering the available propellant after the TCI burn. All scenarios were feasible with the exception of 150 days into the mission which required more delta V than what is available. The Discovery will initiate the descent and landing procedures with a plane change from E2's parking orbit to an inclined plane of 19.5 degrees, giving the landing site location. Then, the descent element will perform a descent orbit insertion burn, lowering to an altitude of 15 kilometers, where it will circularize into a parking orbit until the landing site's azimuth aligns with the orbit. To land the Discovery, the engines will perform a final burn, throttling down to the determined landing target. The landing target would be a landing ellipse of 0.5 km by 1 km, satisfying the ground slope of constraint of 5 degrees. An abort scenario was devised for the vehicle in the case of failure during descent, where the ascent vehicle would jettison from the lander and return the crew to E2. The AE will launch and circularize at a parking orbit of 100 kilometers. After circularization, it will perform a plane change burn to become coplanar with E2. 
Finally, it will perform a home and transfer to rendezvous with E2. After the surface mission is completed, the crew on E2 is required to transfer to E1, as it carries most of the fuel in used in the return trip. The rendezvous and proximity operations for this co-elliptic rendezvous will be performed and completed with an autonomous docking system. The scientific objectives for this project are focused on studying brine formation and composition, cryovolcanic processes, origin and evolution, crustal heterogeneity and stratigraphy, and mineralogical variation. In addition, we will study hydrogeological dynamics, determine the differentiation and thermal evolution, and the habitability of sources of organic material. Okeidos was chosen as the main landing site for the human mission because it contains salty brine exposures. Okeidos okay, has relative low surface slope, displays mineralogical variability, and presents recent geological activities, which makes Okeidos okay, the perfect landing site. We will have three additional exploration targets that will be explored by Spikes and Amigos that will allow us to expand our science. These locations are Haulani Crater, which exhibits exposed shallow cross material, Ahuna Mons, a possible cryovolcanic dome, and Ernutet, which is the most organic rich area in Ceres. Each landing site and exploration target supports the scientific objectives of this mission. The following science payloads have been selected to accomplish the mission's scientific objectives. A strata, a ground penetrating radar, and grass, a gravimeter, which will be used to study the shallow subsurface. HP3, which will help in the study of thermal evolution of Ceres, and the SLN, designed for the lunar environment and will be adapted to work on Ceres. We also have NERVIS, an infrared spectrometer that studies volatiles on the surface, and the NSS. Both will help understand and identify volatiles. We also have MERTIS, a radiometer and thermal infrared spectrometer that will be used to identify the surface composition and mineralogy. And finally, the MT, a magnetotelluric sounder that will be used to determine the occurrence of subsurface water bodies. The spikes will be used as one of the main payloads of the exploration for the RSM with the purpose of arriving at the landing sites and exploration targets that the crew won't be able to explore. Their design contains a survey face and two small 10 cm spikes that come out of a deployable 3 meter truss to penetrate the surface and acquire core samples. The mission will contain a total of four spikes that will explore the four exploration targets. Due to the spike sample return procedures, each spacecraft will have to return to the E1. The Amigos are autonomous, semi-inflatable robotic explorers. Their main purpose is to scout the different candidate exploration sites. Stowed within the dimensions of a one u CubeSat, these deploy to an inflatable sphere. The robots will move around the surface, utilizing hopping maneuvers, which allow them to explore small distances. Each Amigo includes stereo cameras for surface mapping. The RSM will include a total of 32 Amigos distributed in groups of eight per site. They will be deployed from an STB, which will lower their altitude to around 100 meters for deployment. The surface activities that the astronauts will perform during the EVAs include field work, core drilling, geologic sampling, measurements taken with ground penetrating radar, and a gravimeter. All the EVAs have a range of one kilometer, and it's important to point out that during the EVAs, the paralysis will be installed. Five packages for experiments, reconnaissance, and logistics exploration systems, Perales, will be deployed by the astronauts throughout the surface. The Perales will collect data while the astronauts remain on the surface and shortly after they leave while they keep orbiting Ceres. Each Perales will have variations in the instruments that compose them, and the astronauts will be able to place them strategically so that the instruments within each Perales match the scientific interests of each area. The seismic experiments will consist of passive and active experiments. Each Perales will be equipped with one SLN. The seismometers will be installed the first 60 days after landing, and they must be placed at least one kilometer away from the lander. The passive experiments will take place in the first 100 days while the astronauts are in orbit. Their purpose is to listen to serious natural geological processes before any further interventions. 
Lastly, the active experiments will be carried out in orbit during the last 60 to 70 days. In order to generate seismic waves, the surface will be impacted with several CubeSats. The endeavors the spacecraft entrusted when transporting the crew from Earth to Ceres and back share a similar design in their propulsion stage, the main difference being their oral configuration. E1 carries with it scientific payloads to be deployed on its arrival to Ceres, while the E2 configuration contains the life habitat and the logistic module. The propulsion stage of the Endeavours consists of one core stage, two large inline tanks, three small inline tanks, and 12 draft tanks attached to a central truss. The core stage and inline tanks contain zero boil-off cryocoolers, integrated MLI, and spray-on foam insulation, while the draft tanks only have integrated MLI. Lastly, all the tanks were designed using a safety factor of 1.4 and a 3% eulage volume. For the Endeavour vehicles, we use NERVA-derived NTP engines, which produce 111.2 kN of thrust, each at 925 seconds of ISP. The engines are arranged in clusters of three for redundancy purposes, which produce more than 330 kN of total thrust. These engines are non-bimodal and use low-enriched uranium as the fuel for the reactor core. Given past NTP test fires and proposed technology demonstrators in the late 2020s, a TRL-4 was established for this technology. The Life Hub is the module where the crew will spend most of their journey to Ceres and back. The interior is divided into three sections, the first one containing the crew quarters and equipment for exercise, VR, and aromatherapy. The second section contains the laboratory, galley, med bay area, bathroom, and the main structure that houses the battery, fuel cells, ECLA system, and the plant growth system. Finally, the third section of the Life Hub is where food, clothing, and seats are located for safekeeping during the entirety of the mission. The logistics module has the function of connecting the propulsion stage and the life app, allowing access to the science and logistics airlock and inflatable airlocks used for EVAs. It also has a robotic arm implemented to the structure that can manage the SLA. The inflatable airlocks in the RM are the main system for the in-space EVAs. They also have an internal structure composed of longerons and hoops that support the fabric layers during the pressurization. The SLA has the function of carrying the scientific payloads and also functions as a garbage disposal should during the mission. The Discovery Lander is the spacecraft that transports two of the crew to the surface of Ceres, sheltering them during their stay and bringing them back to the DST. It has three major components, which are the ascent element, surface habitat, and the descent element. The lander has two configurations, the surface configuration where all components are deployed and the descent configuration where some antennas are stowed and the support is covered to protect it from engine plumes and dust. The AE is both the lander's navigation center and the means of transporting the crew from the Syrian surface to the DSD. The spacecraft's E-class and electrical systems can operate on their own for a maximum of 14 days in case of an emergency or abort scenario. Because of short duration stays spent by the crew, the habitable volume will be 6.18 meters cubed, and the crew will use an astronaut vest as the main radiation protection. The ascent element engines are composed of six Aerojet Rocketdyne R4D-15 dual mode engines capable of producing 100 pounds of force at nominal thrust. These engines are arranged radially at the top of the ascent element with a 30 degree inclination. They are capable of producing up to 125 pounds of force at 125% of the nominal thrust. The surface habitat will be the astronaut's home while exploring the serene environment. It will be pressurized to 8.2 psi, 34% O2 to allow for shorter previous times and emergency VAs via the suit ports, since both the cabin and the suits will normally operate at the same condition. The SHAP total habitat volume is 150.48 cubic meters. The SHAP will consist of a low gain antenna, a high gain antenna, a modified NDS, food and supply storage, the ECLIS, the bathroom, the Rocky, sleeping bags, three emergency backup batteries, and the air tanks. As for the SHAB layers, these are composed of multiple layers of insulation and protection used to ensure the astronaut's safety and discovery performance. Based on NASA JSC microgravity hybrid inflatable airlock, the team determined the materials and thicknesses for the different layers of all inflatable habitats used in our concept. These diagrams represent each layer and their thickness, providing a total of 0.4 meters of layers. The DE is an octagonal structure made out of aluminum 6061 with a safety factor of 2.96 that stored the propellant tanks used during the recent phase mission. The DE is also tasked with carrying the Perales, radiators, and the platform to support the EVAs. 
The landing system consists of four crushable landing legs made of aluminum 6061 that can be deployed and adjusted to the terrain for optimal landing. Each landing leg is designed to withstand the total weight of the lander with a safety factor of 1.8. The descent element contains four mast and hatch engines for redundancy purposes, capable of producing 750 pounds of force and nominal thrust. This engine has the ability to reach a throttleability of 14%, which is beneficial for landing procedures. For landing, the engine will use a self-creating landing pan called the in-flight alumina spray technique developed by the Masten Spray Systems. For all mass calculation, we incorporated the mass growth allowance, which accounts for the mass uncertainty of the early stage development phase. As a guide, we use the NCAI AA standard for mass growth allowance. The thermal control system consists of a passive TCS that includes MLI and radiators, as well as an active TCS which uses PCM, heat exchangers, cryo coolers, and heaters. Each table includes the details of the system components required, like heater power, ammonia mass, radiator size, as well as temperature limits for each component. This is a diagram of the thermal loops of the endeavors. It contains most of the components mentioned previously. The lander will have a similar structure, but most of the excess heat goes to Ceres instead of outer space. One of the main objectives of this project was to ensure that the crew would be safe and physically and mentally healthy during the 1,100 and 12 days in space. This will be accomplished by mitigating the human risks that come with this type of mission. The use of biosensors will aid in case of medical emergencies and also in monitoring their health. The astronauts will use the Rocky and Sevis equipment for two 45-minute sessions a day to maintain muscle and cardiovascular health. The ACLIS includes water recovery, waste management, air purification, and oxygen nitrogen release. For CO2 waste, a member will take apart the carbon from the oxygen, developing reusable oxygen. For water, urine will be processed and pretreated for it to be used as drinkable water. The atmospheric pressure in both live hab and logistic module will be 14.7 psi, with 21% of O2 throughout the transit to and from series. Discovery's atmosphere will be 8.2 psi, with 34% of O2. The temperature in all habitable volumes will be between 20 to 27 Celsius. In the live hab, the solid waste will be stored in trash bags, which will then be jetsoned through the SLA. In Discovery, it will be stored in container boxes. The med bay of the life hub will be used to assess any health-related issues concerning the well-being of the astronauts. It includes a sterile quarantine space, medicine supply, and basic medical instruments, such as a defibrillator, blood and pulse oximeter, and a portable ultrasound device. A mini-PCR or polymer chain reaction that amplifies a specific sequence of DNA was included to examine possible mutations or defects. To mitigate the effect of homesickness, anxiety, stress, and isolation, the mission will include an omni-VR along with aromatherapy. Natural remedies such as melatonin and teas will also help with these effects. The VR headset will allow the crew to travel and position themselves wherever they want. With aromatherapy, the senses can be stimulated to connect on a deeper level and exercise at the same time. After evaluating the ages of the crew for both sexes and radiation exposure capacity, the team decided to have the age range from 30 to 40. Although the group from 40 to 50 can withstand more radiation, this group also has a higher risk of developing high blood pressure levels, arthritis, bone and muscle loss, along with visual in-flight and post-flight issues. The nature of the mission inhibits prepackaged food capabilities. The implementation of the Astro Garden alleviates this constraint. The Astro Garden consists of several closed modules where plants are grown aeroponically. The life habitat will be able to grow 480 plants at a time, which will be used to complement the crew's diet. Some of these crops will include lettuce, spinach, and legumes like kidney beans and lentils. The use of aeroponics reduces water and space required to grow crops, reducing the initial food mass from 11,000 kilograms to 4,600 kilograms. The endeavors will use ultra flex solar array of 5, 6, and 7.5 meters of diameter, 28% efficiency, and TRL of 6, to supply the necessary electrical energy during the trajectory. These solar panels will use a multi junction cell to obtain the best performance while the spacecraft is away from the sun. Lithium ion rechargeable batteries with 11 kilowatt hour capacity will be used as energy storage and energy backup. E2 will use four proton exchange membrane fuel cell units with hydrogen as fuel. The lander will have an origami solar panel, which will be the primary energy source. 
Once on solid surface, the astronaut will deploy the solar panel at the surface, covering a total area of 42 square meters, generating the necessary energy for the Discovery lander. Batteries will be used to provide power overnight. A battery bank will be used for the mitigation of a worst-case scenario emergency. Overall, each spacecraft will use high-gain antennas and low-gain antennas to communicate with each other and will be able to cross-band between KA-band and X-band satellite communications using a digital channelizer. Spacecraft to Earth communication will be possible with the Deep Space Network. The AE will be able to communicate with the S-HAB and both systems with the lm life hab The lm life hab will also be able to communicate with the E2LGA and with the dsn 34 meter bwg subnet. E1 as well will be able to communicate with both the lm life hab and dsn 34 meter bwg subnet by relaying communications when the lm life hab is connected to the E2 and cannot communicate with the subnet. The Perales would also be able to communicate with the S-HAB with the use of its low-gain antenna. A dual processing board with two identical RAT 750 single-board computers will be used in each spacecraft as main processing units. The computers will use a QMR implementation providing security to the data. Both A1 and A2 will use ACE and TRN as navigation systems. For the discovery, the MPU and a Mustang will be used in order to avoid the overloading of the data management. Additionally, there will be two artificial intelligence systems called Spock and Aries to help classify terrain. A group of sensors based in the MELD2 system will be used, such as thermocouples, heat flux, and pressure transducers. Another group of sensors based on the MEDA system will record, record atmospheric parameters and dust properties. Each spacecraft will have CCD and MCCD for surveillance. For the protection of the electronic components, we use the SPEMBIS program to simulate the total analysing doses on the trajectory and on the surface targeting a specific material for the simulation. The Q96 was used to analyze the flux of the GCR. The Shield of CQ provides us with three shielding configurations where we use the spherical shielding for simulation as a worst case scenario. After analyzing the results obtained from the simulation and considering the solar protons and heavy ions from the sun, one millimeter thick aluminum shielding was chosen since it will protect up to 100,000 kilowatts and therefore mitigate the effects that the electronic components could suffer in emission. The team developed a tailored cost estimation tool to distribute the project's cost and verify compliance with a 3 billion per year constraint. The CET is made up of seven different areas regarding the entire cost of the cipher. And those areas are contract labor, civil servant labor, testing and materials and fabrications, instruments, launches, and technology integration. For accuracy, every area was divided per year based on the project's phases during the time of development. The cost of each area studied is represented in the following figure. And with this set, the total cost of the cipher throughout the 11 years of development is $20.93 billion USD. A risk analysis was created and developed to analyze specific risks that could occur throughout the mission while also studying ways to mitigate them without affecting the rest of the components. The matrix was created by studying risks per area, amounting to 65 total risks and reduced to 10 of the most severe to show in the figure being presented. The cipher provides an innovative yet feasible mission concept for a crude mission to series. Our systems and design incorporate five proven and promising technologies enabling this endeavor to discover more about the solar system. We, the Cypher team, would like to thank our mentors, family members, and friends for their continued support and guidance throughout the duration of this project. We dedicate this project to our former mentor, Dr. Oscar Perales, who passed away in November 2020. Thank you, Professor.